What's up, guys? Welcome to KP Community, episode number 14. We got a KP special tonight, bringing on Jake Woodford from the Cardinals. Jake, How's welcome. Going? Doing good, man. Welcome to the crib. Yeah, happy to be here. Yeah, awesome. Well, uh, tonight we are talking all about Jake's career and about Jake's training environment, uh, about what he's been thinking about, what he's been working on, and kind of the path to where he's been. So excited to dump, jump into uh, kind of your career and where you've been. We've yeah. known each other now for what, two years, two and a half years, three years almost. Yeah, it might be three now. Yeah. Three, geez, time flies. Uh, Woody's been a staple at KP over that period of time. Appreciate uh, all the time in and, and all the work. I know we've been through a lot, man. Curveball work and slider work. Yeah, and new sliders, different fastballs. and All kind of stuff, dude. Yeah. So Always changing. Um, Jake's a uh, great personality around the facility. Always been good to the younger guys especially. Appreciate that. And uh, excited tonight to have him on. Uh, first time we've done this, a little KP special, like I said, uh, kind of diving in. We're going to go through a couple other uh, of our athletes. So excited to have Jake here tonight. Jake, any questions on community? I mean, I know you've seen a couple, displayed a couple to you, but any yeah, questions? I mean, just excited to be here. Love it, dude. Yeah. Excellent. We'll jump in tonight. Uh, going to start off with a couple questions, just kind of discussing with you kind of your process, your journey up. Uh, really one of the big things, you know, we talk so much about analytics. We talk so much about our process and the growth of kind of, you know, developing players from a very young age to, to getting to all where you're at and, and to into the big leagues. And so uh, I want to kind of go over your path, your process, and, and really kind of where you started from and get all the way up to where we are today and talk about the journey of kind of player development as a whole. Uh, kind of some of that self-education process and some of the big influencers, some of the big things that have, have kind of helped you uh, kind of create the career you've had to date. Um, so let's uh, let's start off with Jake. Where did things start off for you in baseball? Kind of give me a little background on uh, little Jake and, and what uh, he did as a kid. <laughs> yeah, so I grew up playing basketball and baseball. Um, loved them both. Pretty much focused on those two sports. Um, and then, yeah, I just kind of fell in love with baseball uh, when I got around the high school age. I uh, decided to stop playing basketball, focus entirely on baseball, and kind of give that my all. So did you play baseball, like T-ball up, or did you start yeah, later? Yeah, I played, I played baseball my whole life. Nice. I, was, I was playing baseball when I was like four years old. Awesome. So it was always something I liked and not something that we really had in the family. My dad played basketball, ran track, didn't really – love baseball so I don't, I don't really know where i got it from i just always been a passion always a pitcher yeah yeah i i wasn't a great hitter <laughs> <laughs> I, I could never really hit so talk to me about um kind of high school experience uh i know you did uh some of the the you know showcases and, and things like that i know you played on some teams and things like that kind of give me a little background on the high school experience uh things that you look back on today and, and kind of uh, really loved and things that you kind of look back on today and, and maybe uh, say you may have done something different possibly like can you yeah. give a little, little background there a little history so I, I played a lot of baseball because I wanted to so I, I was never forced to play but I always wanted to play so I did play a good bit of travel ball um, for, for me in high school when I started playing summer ball I didn't you know, I would kind of guest play here and there on occasion, you know, in certain tournaments or certain showcases and stuff like that. But for the most part, early on, it was it was just our group of friends. We had, I think it was like 13 or 14 guys in the same class in high school. And so we would just take our high school team and go play in tournaments and kind of pick up a few guys along the way. Um, I really enjoyed that because it was just playing baseball with your friends in the summer. So I, it kept it fun. It kept it, you know, we were all just out there trying to get better and, and develop. Um, and so for me, I, I wouldn't change that. I, I love the, you know, I have great memories of, of those summers. Um, but it, yeah, I definitely have seen the, the travel ball and the summer ball kind of get to a point that can be a little excessive at times. So I think there's a fine line. But yeah, I'm, for me, it was, it was just, I wanted to play. I wanted to be out there and, and competing. And I, I tried to balance it with basketball for two years and it just kind of got to be too much. And so once I kind of went full baseball, it was something that I could just really dive into. Yeah, that's awesome. So what were, um, so you committed to a school. What what year, like kind of what did that look like for you? How did that recruiting process yeah, kind of transpire was, for you? Um, 
it was pretty sudden for me. I, I had other schools I was interested in, but I always grown up a Florida fan. Mm-hmm. So mom, brother, aunt all went to school there. We, you know, we just grew up rooting for the Gators. So I was always a big Gator fan. And so for me, I think it was my summer after my freshman year. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I had a couple good tournaments and we were kind of bouncing around and playing some of the showcases and I had a really good game. And then they offered to, you know, go on a unofficial visit and just check out the campus. And I, I loved it when I was there and I was it kind of felt like that was the place I needed to be. And so I, I committed early. I had a pretty good idea of where I wanted to go before that happened also, which I think helped. Um, but I'm, Never ended up there, so yeah, that's all right. So tell me about that that yeah, process. So, kind of what was the decision making process like there? I mean, obviously, you know, committed young, right, yeah. and and uh, maybe younger than most. Um, and as you kind of got through high school, <clears throat> you get up to this decision making period, uh, and some guys face this, and and obviously, very talented at that age for yourself, and and had an opportunity to see both sides or have the opportunity to, to weigh both sides. But kind of give me. Uh, some of the the thought process around weighing both sides. I mean, college is that's a big decision, right? Yeah, like, I mean, I went through it. Yeah, college is a big decision. Do I want to get there? And 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 education. And you know, I'm sure mom was maybe telling you that, yeah. hey, I want you to have an education one day, right? Like, yeah. tell me about that decision making process and what really kind of you know, uh, how you kind of evaluated those two bins. Yeah. So it's hard because. You have to, if you go to a four year university, you have to go for three years. So you're not making the decision that, at least for a lot of guys, you know, if you go JUCO or, or different routes, you can, you know, you have different circumstances. But uh, for me, I, I knew I was going to go to Florida. And so it's a decision that's going to affect the next three years of your life. And you're pretty young when you make the decision. So it's, it's definitely weighing your options. I, I felt that I was mature enough to go out on my own and, and handle a, uh, uh, professional season I, I knew it was going to be longer and, and kind of different than what a college experience would be and I just I weighed that with really loving baseball and kind of wanting to go play every day and learn and learn from the best people in, in, in the world and get to experience that and then you know the third the third component is money you know that's it's something that as you go farther and farther in this game, you realize it's also a business and that it's, it's something that not only you, but other people consider in the sport all the time is, yeah. is the monetary value of things. Absolutely. So I, I love, so I went through this, a similar process. Then I didn't get a chance. I kind of had to end up on the opposite side, right? I ended up in the college space and right. um, you know, my story a little bit. And, and so, you know, I, I think back over that period of time and, uh, I laugh because I today as a coach doing what I do today, you know, my knowledge level of where I was at in my my high school age, especially, you know, I see a different game today. And like I see it because I'm older, because I've got experience, because yeah. I'm also coaching this is my life, my, my my career, you know, looking back at yourself at that time, um, you know, we're going to kind of I want to get to you in pro ball. But, um, how, you know, looking back today, how matured do you think you were as a high school athlete? I, so and I, I preface this by saying that a lot of our athletes walk through the door as high school athletes. Right. And me today, knowing where they are, I go, man, like there's so much ahead of you. Like you have yeah. so much that you're going to learn in the next five years. Like you have no idea, like with your perspective, like perceiving yourself from back in high school, like what are some of the things that you felt maybe that you really expanded on over the next five years? So it could be like strength or pitch types or like yeah. knowledge. What, what did you really learn over those next, maybe a couple of things? What did you really like kind of fully see yourself okay. definitely on over those years? Yeah. Um, I would say I'd start the biggest thing is routine. I, I've gotten much more routine oriented over the years because it's so much easier to control. What do you mean? What do you mean by that? Like dive a little deeper on. I mean, pick something. You know, it's whether it's supplements, training routine, throwing routine, recovery, rehab. The list goes on and on. If you can, in in my scenario, I guess it's different for everybody, but for me, um, it benefited from having a more structured schedule, something that I can map out to where I knew if I did everything there 
I was going to put myself in a good situation. And it doesn't really stop. I, you, your schedule becomes a little bit more flexible, a lot more flexible in the off season because you have so much downtime. And then the flip side of that kind of happens in season where it's very rigid, strict times, game times, bus times, stuff like that stretch. So being able to kind of go about my day throughout my career has evolved a lot from, you know, early on, I was kind of showing up and figuring out my day as I went. And maybe in the off season, I, I wasn't mapping out my my schedule for next month or what I was going to do you know, for throwing I had a schedule but not quite as comprehensive as I have now not, not nearly as comprehensive <laughs> as we have now thanks um <laughs> which is is something that just I think happens over time I, mm -hmm. I think the more you're exposed to stuff and the more you realize that there's tools out there that can help you um, and in my head I wanted to take advantage of them and, and learn about them so routine would be one of the bigger things for me, I think. Um, yeah, I think that's, I mean, I think that's huge. Like, I think that, that that's like, it seems so like, it's almost like so much common sense that like, yeah. yeah, as you get older, you become more mature and you get more of a routine. Right. But like, I think even like from where I'm at now, like I see that with parents, right. And, yeah. and players, when they walk through the door on day one, the assessment day, like I hear parents sometimes say, they make this statement like, uh, you know, I just, I'm not sure he's a real hard worker. And I'm like, I'm yeah. Like, well, you're asking, you know, to get put into an environment where it's going to be sink or swim. Like right. you're either going to have to figure out how to do that and become very routine oriented and become very, uh, regimented, not just in baseball, by the way, that's like in life, yeah, it's, some, it's someday everything. that's going to get hit. Right. You're going to get hit with that. Right. Like you have to become routine. Um, but then we have these like, you know, young athletes that, uh, they come in and you give them the program and their expectation is like, Hey, I'm, I'm just going to do the program and, and get right. some sort of benefit out of it. Yeah. And it's not like having to actually think through and like manipulate their day schedule and handle like when friends ask them on Friday night to go to, a, you know, do something. And it's like, okay, well, yeah, you've got to learn when to prioritize right. your day. And, and it sounds like I know you well enough where, you know, your everything you do is very prioritized. It's very routine. And, and uh, it's one of the things I think, uh, makes you who you are is you're able to kind of self-evaluate, you know, your situation where you're at. Um, and I love that. So, I mean, I think it comes down to if we're, if we're, you know, in your career so far, you know, to where we're at in discussion so far, right. We go from, from you being young to where you are kind of choosing that college route and then kind of expanding from there to, you know, obviously making a decision around pro ball. Um, but I, if you had to, give a parent or player advice right in building that routine or in prioritizing time like where would you say uh if you're talking like a 16 year old right kind of that yeah. middle of high school space like where would you encourage them to maybe prioritize more of a focus in their career at this moment do you have any like thoughts around that like where yeah i so i would say start small would be my biggest suggestion because it can it can be a little daunting at times to try and make this big, elaborate, comprehensive routine. Sometimes it's hard to know where to start or um, have a just have a good idea of, of what you're doing at the time. So just I would just say start small. Uh, if you're 16, so you're in high school. When I was in high school, started at 7:33 a.m. and then I think went to 3 p.m. Mm -hmm. So that's priority number one. You're not going to miss school. You're you know, more than likely going to be there every day. That's going to be your number one priority. Probably going to have practice. So you factor in two or three hours of practice. That's your second priority. That's already scheduled in. Find, I don't know, 20 minutes in your day, 15 minutes in your day where you know consistently or maybe it's three times a week that you're going to have that block sectioned off and make note of it and three times a week do something in that 15 minutes that you haven't been doing before. Learn a foam rolling routine. Maybe you're not taking care of your body as well as you should. Learn a stretching routine. If you've been evaluated and you have certain, you know, certain things in your body that are imbalanced or you lack mobility or lack strength, find them. Find figure out what those are and find exercises or prehabs, stuff that you can do to start to just help smaller things throughout your day. Because um, you're obviously going to be covering your, your major things throughout your day. You know, you're going to school, you have practice, you're going to 
handle all your major building blocks of your baseball day at practice for the most part. So what what little thing can you find at home that, I don't know, maybe it helps your arm feel a little bit better the next day because you start, you know, you start trigger pointing and that's something that is is big for you and it takes 10 minutes and you do it at the, you know, after dinner and you do it three times a week and start there and then just build off that. And you'd be surprised. You're going to look up in four to six months and go, wow, on Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, I do this. Tuesday, Thursdays, I do this. Saturday's my recovery day. I do 45 minutes of this. And now you have this whole routine where if you just stick to that over time, you're going to see progress and you're going to see results, which just the consistency is what's so tough, Yeah. which you hear a lot in baseball because it is a failure-based game and we play a lot of games. So. Yep. Absolutely. I, so Gary and I talk about this when we, we talk about guys that are trying to gain or lose weight. And it's funny yeah. because one of the biggest things we'll ask them is like, hey, did you track it on your on your MyFitnessPal? And they go, oh, well, I, you know, it was it was late and I forgot and, and my friend came over and, and this. And it's like he ate out and I didn't know what's yeah. in this. Yeah. And it's like, dude, consistency. That's all it is. Like, yeah. just That's take- a huge example is, is meal prepping. Is exactly. A lot of kids that can't gain weight, they say, oh, well, I just can't gain weight. I have a fast metabolism. Well, no, eat more. It's, you know, it's just math. It's figure out what your caloric intake needs to be for the day. Find healthy foods. Talk to people. Use your resources. You don't even need to talk to people. The internet nowadays is incredible. <laughs> it's, it. The amount Google. of information on that yep. is, is so cool. It's just, if you really want to try and get to the next level, it's stuff you're going to have to do because there's a lot of talented people out there. Yeah. And they don't stop every year. There's a draft, you know, it's constantly reoccurring and there's every year you're around, there's more and more talent in the talent pool. So yep. you have to try and set yourself apart in some way, shape or form. I love it. And so that brings me to my next point, um, which is I know your draft class was kind of a unique draft class in the sense that, um, you know, if you really look back at it, uh, my draft class was kind of starting to get into some of the analytic push and some of the change in baseball. And so you went from um, kind of an age range where, you know, the analytics weren't super talked about uh, in baseball to then being analytics being everything that baseball right. is about yeah. right now, right? And and so um, talk to me a little bit about how um, you've grown. So you talked about the internet and like being able to Google things and learn things. Yeah, and, and, I, and, and talk to me a little bit about that and talk to me about how that, you know, that, mentality in baseball shift and kind of how you dealt with it yourself during that time yeah so when I was drafted I I basically had no knowledge of any kind of saber metrics or statistics or any kind of metrics we use for pretty much day-to-day pitching now um, so for me it was something that I had to learn throughout my career my first my first year I I kind of would talk to some people about it, rovers, but I never understood it, and it, the conversation kind of stopped there. And then it took time for me to start to recognize the value in it and seeing how it could benefit me and understanding what kind of pitcher I was, what I did well, what I didn't do well, what I need to work on. Just It kind of just gave me a clearer picture for what kind of pitcher I was and what I needed to do to become the kind of pitcher I wanted to be. It, it kind of just filled in the gaps for me. So it was something that I had zero familiarity with early on. And over the years, I'll bring up the internet again. I mean, the amount of podcasts you can go on. I mean, the amount of people that put out free articles and free philosophies. And I mean, yeah, there's going to be a lot of BS out there. And it's your job to sift through it. But there's going to be a lot of people that are out there that have really good stuff and really good information. and a lot of people put out their content for free. So the only reason why you haven't learned more, expanded on that idea or that concept is you haven't looked or you haven't applied yourself. And I, I'm fortunate because I have a lot of resources. I've been working with you for the last three years. You've helped educate me on a lot more stuff as well. And so it, it's something that definitely there's a fine line between you know, paralysis by analysis and you know, the numbers have become kind of crazy. The, there's always a new stat coming out. There's always a new <laughs> metric coming out. There's always a new way to measure uh, certain things about the pitch and, and what makes certain pitches unique or 
that much more you know effective so it's always going to be evolving and I don't think we'll ever stop learning about it I think it's just going to become something that's kind of ingrained in baseball is there will always be a human aspect of it but there's also going to be a pretty extensive analytical aspect to it too yeah absolutely and, and you know I think it's uh you you bring up a great point you, you talk about it and you know, you so fluidly talk about it, like, you know, really reality is you're on the field as a player and people talk about like the players versus the nerds. And it's like this big divide. And and they also talk about, you know, new school versus old school. And um, like, I know you and I've had great conversations about this where there's, you know, great coaches across the board, like, and, and yeah. there's always information to be learned and there's always something to, to be open to discussing um and it's not like we can't categorize people like across how they're right. approaching things like they're designed and they're put in roles like their roles are sorry the roles are designed to to create uh information that's that's supportive to your success and so it's up to you though to ultimately cultivate that thing and have that success and uh, i know you've done an amazing job of that over your career like you have been Thank able you. to adjust and you have you know, evaluated yourself personally, you've evaluated yourself in the eyes of others and been able to, you know, forge success at the highest level. And that's, you know, I know you're still wanting to continue to build and continue to grow. And you're like, I'm, I'm not that, not done yet. I'm not stopped. Absolutely not. But um, to this date, to where you are today, I know you've made some very large changes in, in season and out of season um, to put yourself in a successful space uh, to continue on with your career and, and get guys out at the highest level. So um, you know, one of the things I really want to talk about, and, and you know where I'm going with this, which is, you know, talking about your transitions from, you know, you were in minor league ball of heavy, heavy four seam use and, and everything top of the zone, heavy ride, big curve ball, uh, you know, something that we worked in the off season a lot. Slider was always great. Um, you know, but this year in the big leagues, you made some adjustments. Yeah, started changing stuff up a little bit. Yeah, and yeah. and I mean that was I was shocked when I saw it, um, and but then again not shocked at all because I know you well enough and I know the people you're talking to, and I know that there's a um, a self exploration and understanding um, that that was the right move for you. So talk about that. Why you found success in those changes, and and I'm going to talk a little bit on maybe how that's counter to. Uh, some of the beliefs of the analytics community, so to speak, in certain cases, but then how it works for you and things that I've seen. So give me a little background on some of the yeah. change and, and I'll kind of want to riff on it a little bit further. Okay. So I, I've actually switched back and forth. I've changed my arsenal a ton over the years. I ended up scrapping my curveball after I got drafted, pretty much relied extensively on sinkers. We were essentially no four seamers until I got to double A scuffling pretty bad and that was the first year I really dove into it because I was having decent success at the levels before that and so I never had that push to really learn about it because I just kind of thought oh well what I'm doing right now works you get to a certain point where if what you are doing stop work stops working um, you're put in a situation where you either keep banging your head against the wall or you change something and so I sat down with um, a guy named Paul Davis, and he was our assistant pitching coordinator, and kind of just asked him a few questions and asked what he thought, and he said, "You're, you know, we don't have to go super deep into analytics, but essentially you need to throw four seamers because your sinker isn't sinking." Explained to me a lot of stuff, and that was my first big introduction into it, and I bought in for that, and I had a better second half. Fast forward a year later, I kind of flipped the script and exclusively four seams learning a new spiked curveball, which I hadn't thrown in four years. And I was probably that pitcher for two and a half years. And then this year rolls around. And I think this kind of goes into it. There's no perfect formula for how you use analytics and how you use, you know, just input from other people. Because for me, I first found out my sinker was doing something I hadn't been doing before in live BPs with our hitters. I randomly mixed one in just to, I, I think it was away from a lefty or something like that. And one of the guys was like, hey, that, that moved decent. Like, why don't you throw that a little more? Started throwing it a little more. And what I found was, although it analytically isn't a pitch that is 
super plus in terms of a sinker, let's vertical break, horizontal, just that kind of stuff. It differentiates enough from my four seam to serve as an effective pitch. And so as long as I maintain a quality pitch mix and don't become too predictable, I, I can almost use my fastball as two different pitches, which is something that it's my most comfortable pitch, probably the pitch I command the best. So if I can throw more fastballs, but use, utilize them as different pitches, it's going to be beneficial for me. And that was something that I really explored this year. And this was the first year I had a more, it wasn't 50-50, but a more even mix of my fastball usage, which it took, it just kind of took time to figure out. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, because if you look at my sinker on paper, you don't say, hey, that's, you need to throw that pitch more. You say, eh, your four seam's probably better. But if a guy sees four four seamers in a row and his second at bat comes around and he tries to ambush a fastball and it has nine to 10 inches of less of vertical break and has more run, two miles an hour slower, it's, it's you know, you could get a first pitch out on someone by just mixing in a sinker. And what I enjoyed about it was it gave me the ability to, to kind of use it as a strength against certain lineups. You know, so certain lineups I would maybe go more four seams, certain lineups I'd maybe go more sinker depending on their strengths, my strengths. And it, I felt that it just kind of helped me match up with people a little bit better. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, we could talk about the slider a little bit too yeah. in, in this case. And, and But um, I think, you know, it's like biomechanics. Um, you know, we have good ideas of what makes somebody a harder thrower or a better performer. But it's not absolute in the sense yeah. that I look at some guys and I go, well, there's underlying reasons why that person should or shouldn't do that thing. And so when we look at analytics, especially, I think one of the, the greatest powers that we have, it's amazing we can analyze all the success metrics or, or failure metri metrics that we have, um, break them out into categories, bin them, uh, try to find a, a space that makes us understand our stuff. Right. Um but it's more of an evaluation tool. And I think it's also, it helps us formulate our roadmap better. Um, and this is why I say like, there's this crossover between new school and old school. And it's not one or the other, it's the blend of both. Yeah. Like it's some awareness. And, and so I love this idea that like, you know that you were more successful this year, right? Yeah. And you felt more comfortable and you can now look at the analytics and replicate that thing that you felt made you where you are in the league this year so if you look at that and you say like okay my my sinker it was x profile okay great let's hold on to that like yeah. let's well you let's... can always use it as a reference point exactly and that's what's that's something that is extremely beneficial for me is at any point in the season after any outing which i basically check them after every outing just to check in on them but you can compare how your pitches were moving the profile of your pitches exactly to a time you were good or maybe a time you were bad or a time you felt great. It, there's, it gives you a point of reference to always go back to, which is something I enjoy about it because there's comfort in knowing, Hey, when I was really good, this is what my stuff was doing. And right now I don't feel very effective and my results aren't great. And two of my four pitches aren't, they do not have the same profile that they did four months ago, which four months is, you know, that's over the course of a season that that happens, stuff like that happens. And just being able to get back to that, however you can get back to that most effective form is, is something that I think a lot of people struggle with and try and become really effective at. And that's yeah. what makes them great players is they always make adjustments. I remember my dad talked about, uh, he was a, he was a uh, college baseball player and where he talked about in college, there was this one time where he went off and he just had this this road series and he just felt so good. Uh, it might have been like a couple of weeks. I can't remember exactly how the story goes, but uh, he had a they had a video camera and they ran and got the video camera and he set it up during the game and he watched it. They tried to record uh, his swings. And so uh, he wanted to save those videos for the future to, yeah. to reference and look back on and try to remember um and he said man if i had had the stuff we had today like i may not have slumped ever i might have been Crazy. i might have been you know whatever a, a 500 hitter and um i laugh at that because that is really what we're doing right like that is we're just defining we're able to to dive deeper into who we are what we do um and how we can how we can improve like how we can take our best guesses right and yeah. 
So like, I, I love your, your transition there. You went from like, Hey, I was young and I was learning. And then like, I had this, this success moment where I figured out my four seam was like, man, that's a great pitch for me. Like, yeah, I really, no play, yeah. All the time. yeah. So you went like way over and you're like, I'm going to throw only four seams and go, and go Ohio, everything up in the zone and, and just kill it. Right. And so it's like, you had to like, you like overcorrected and then yeah. you kind of came back to center and I'm sure I'll eventually probably go make back one way. <laughs> way a little bit at some point in time. It's, it's something that I think is always going to happen. You see yeah. the best players in the game do it. Yeah. You see, uh, Justin Verlander learn a new slider when yeah. he goes, yeah, this guy's been <laughs> a former Cy Young award winner. Yeah. He's got some of the best stuff in baseball and he's learning a new pitch from, uh, their pitching coach. Yeah. John. And yeah. it's, if that doesn't show you right there, like, yeah. Hey, you just, and there's, a, there's countless examples of that, of, of people picking up new pitches and, and trying to become more effective and, and just improving your weaknesses. If your strengths are great and there's nothing you need to do to, yeah. You know, change your fastball. Your fastball is elite. All right. Okay. Sure. Figure out your curveball. Figure maybe you're a two pitch guy out of the bullpen. Maybe try and learn a third pitch. All right. Well, I don't have a third pitch. All right. Well, have you ever thrown a splitter? No. All right. Well, try freaking splitter. I yeah. don't know. Like, <laughs> just uh, try, always being curious and always trying to evolve. I think is something that's really important in this game. Yeah. Uh, because so, if you if you don't, people are going to make adjustments to you, 100%. and it happens so quick. One hundred percent. If you're not making, there's a fine line. Obviously, you're going to have your bread and butter stuff that you do through and through all the time, and that's not something that you never get away from. But maybe it's location or pitch usage or percentage. You know, there's just so many things you can tweak without having to tweak your actual arsenal. Yeah. You don't have to change pitches all the time. There's so many other things you can change. Yep, so, absolutely. Well, I, I love the, the slider example real quick. I want to go to this. So, so I looked at your slider on paper. Uh, from the season and some things have changed a little bit like yeah. some I like joked I was like it's the same same but different right like it, it, it's like yeah, it's the same slider but it's a little different um talk to me about that and kind of the uh kind of the thought process behind that we know we talk about the four seam the two seam um you, know, you have a, a huge breaking ball right and and something that we've looked at in facility and I know you and I have talked about and um I think there's something to be said about the pitch types that you possess like that you utilize most often as well like i laughed because somebody brought you up in a conversation like man i love his slider and i was like you've never seen his curveball <laughs> <laughs> like i promise you if you stand in facility and watch his curveball you're gonna fall in love with that right um so talk about like you know really uh how you utilize those two and why the slider is kind of more predominant and and a little bit about like um you know what you do in the off season uh, to kind of get prepared for a season um, to take that transition uh, stage from in season to out of season, to off season with this mix, like with this stuff, you clearly know your stuff. Well, like yeah, you clearly I, have a good feel for it. Yeah, right. So, so talk to me a little bit about that process and, and how you chosen to kind of go with the pitch mix that you have. Okay. So I always threw a slider, but it was always kind of a, shorter tighter slider called a slutter you know, threw it pretty mm -hmm. hard and it was consistent but it was something in my game i was trying to improve on was my swing and miss percentage and i was trying to get my chase percentage up a little bit and the slider i was throwing for a long time i threw it for years it, it was a little bit more of a contact pitch because it didn't have a huge movement profile it was a relatively um it was, it was relatively tight so i I was just curious one day I was kind of just chopping it up with the guys in the bullpen and um, we had just played, uh, I think Milwaukee and Freddie Peralta's slider is like, <laughs> I mean, it is like one of the best of the best. Yeah. It is disgusting. And I was watching him pitch. And I was like, ah, this thing, I, I need to learn how to throw this. And one of them, one of the guys knew how he threw, he kind of throws that weird two seam slider and they showed me and I just started practicing with it and, Two or three weeks later, I was like, this kind of feels good. You know, I want to get on the mound. And I went on the track man a few times. And I, I never, I haven't thrown my old slider since. Love it. That's awesome. So the track man numbers kind of supported what I was feeling of, hey, I think this is a better pitch. They kind of gave me that reinforcement of, hey, this is the exact same pitch, except one thing increased a lot, which is good. So stick with it. So I stuck with it. And there was a learning curve, and there's still a learning curve. but I'm definitely more comfortable 
with it now because I, I just kind of trusted it and was able to have that trust in it from the get-go because I knew there were multiple things that were telling me, hey, this can be a very effective pick. Sure. And so when do you, this is the question I have for you on this, is when do you decide, so it sounds like you've made some in-season adjustments. Yeah. And so how do you decide what is an in-season adjustment for you, whether it be just you know pitch type or, or other stuff, biomechanics, et cetera? When do you decide or how do you kind of process the difference between an in-season adjustment versus maybe an off-season adjustment? Yeah, so in-season for me, it it's always going to be focused. Your actions are always going to be focused to trying to become a better player and improve on your ability. But for me, in-season, it is all about competing and putting up results. Yes, the minor leagues are about development and you want to develop. And earlier on in your career, you have a little bit more of an opportunity to that. But once you get to the highest level, the only thing that matters is winning sure. and, and putting up results and trying to help your team win. So for me in season, I only make adjustments when I feel that it's going to help me that season. I, I, I'm may, maybe not as inclined to do something in season if I feel like it's going to take a longer time or it's going to be a more uncomfortable transition to where it's something that's like, hey, you're, you're going to need to practice this a lot and the results aren't going to be good for a little while because it's going to be uncomfortable. That's something I maybe wouldn't do in season because in season – you, you got to put up results and at the end of the day that's what it's about so for me in season is whatever i can do to be more effective the next time out i'm going to do it and i do that for the year and i try and finish stronger in the end than i did in the beginning and then as you tr kind of transition into the off season now it becomes okay what major thing do i want to change or what you know handful of smaller things do i really want to emphasize this off season in a setting where if I do fail or it isn't how I want it to be, it's okay because I can come back tomorrow and I can work on it. Sure. And I can keep working on it every day for the next four months. And I can, you know, iron it home to the point where I'm comfortable with it. And then that way when the season comes around, it's no longer trying to figure it out or manipulating stuff and, you know, and trying to become more comfortable with it. It becomes, okay, how do I use this to get guys out and how does this benefit me? And then the process just kind of keeps going. You just go round and round. Yeah, we talk about it in macro and micro cycles. So we talk yeah. about an off season as a macro cycle. Right. It could be four or five months. And then the micro cycles are kind of the months in between. You yeah. know, what how are you, you doing that bullpen in between outings that helps? Because there are adjustments you can make yeah. in a bullpen that are going to significantly help your next time out. It could be something small. It could be something big. But it, for me, you, you have to use that time with a lot of focus and a lot of intent because that is how you make necessary adjustments to yep. continue to perform. Well, I love that it's, you know, we talk about like you have you have off season, you have in season. And I like to tell our guys to take the in season and break it apart into like thirds. And so you have like the first third, the second third, third third and kind of have goals within those thirds. So we have like macro cycle of the off season itself, which is the full off season, micro cycles which is like month to month or phases like a on ramp, a velocity phase, uh, whatever. And then you have your in season where you have like, okay, my first third, like my goal is to establish my stuff. And yeah. like my second goal, my second uh, third is, you know, I want to, I want to, you know, maybe, uh, you know, throw my slider, whatever to X amount of percentage. And, um, and then, you know, third third, you have more kind of specific to like with and things like that. Right. So um, I kind of tell guys to break it down a little bit differently uh, based upon those, those outputs, but, it requires an off season. I think this is, we look back at like the younger level. We talk about travel ball to begin with a little bit. We talk about the younger level and uh, I love what you said about, you know, failure. Like you need a time where if it's not yeah. working, I can either bang it or I can go, you know what? I need to reevaluate it. Yeah. And that only happens when you have four to five months to really spend time building and playing. I mean, I know like last off season, you and I were like, you know, in the lab, you yeah. know, with, with ball flight unit, like working through stuff and kind of talking about stuff. And, and it takes that kind of time. I think you as a big leaguer have the advantage, right? I mean, uh, you're in your twenties, you know, you look at guys that are in their early teens and they're playing year round. They never yeah. have that moment to actually experience or experiment with something, right. right. Or develop themselves physically. Like, um, I think that's one of the biggest paradoxes, like in the, in the youth level, in baseball that you get to experience it now 
you know, being where you're at and, right. and, you know, coming out of the offseason, I know every year we have this sit down, like where we, we talk and it's like, Hey, what are your goals for the offseason? Oh man, I'm thinking about to work on. Yeah, I think I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I want to, I'm really excited about trying to get back and, and work on these things. I hear that excitement in your guys' voices, right? Where it's like, I really want to do X. It's like, okay, great. Let's set it up. Let's okay. do it. Let's come up with a strategy, a plan. Let's execute it. So, uh, it's cool to hear you say that. Talk about failure in that because most guys only think in the realm of, I need to do X, therefore I'm going to do it in the off season. But you have the reality, you know what? I'm going to try it. Like, yeah. give it a shot, see if it works. If it doesn't work, it's okay. I know there's a window of time here for me to, to be okay with it. I don't have to just compete with it in the moment. Right. And if you have to decide those two pieces, I hear this from parents a lot too, that it's like, I have off season, in season, like when do I work on this thing? Well, you can't really always do it in season if it's not going to pay off in the immediate moment because you're going to go out to the, you know, a tournament and parents are going to be upset because you're, you know, you're just being four kids trying right. to throw a new two seamer or something. Right. In the off season, you have that availability, that space where you can kind of safe space where you can kind of come in and, and do your thing. So, right. um, well, and you can, you, sorry, I just no, no, do yeah, add it, add it. thing on that was you can still keep a competitive environment in the off season. I, I didn't want to make that sound like, you know, you, you get in the off season and it's just like, try whatever you want. No, like you still have competitive stuff. We, sure. you compete in the weight room. Yep. I, at least in my experience, I work out with a great group of guys and we, we push each other and we have a great group at KP that when we're throwing, I mean, I threw a touch and field today, like yep. six pitches or eight pitches or whatever <laughs> it was. And all the guys came down and, you know, we just, that's support, but it's also them pushing you to become better and just because you're trying something new or or tinkering with something doesn't mean you can't be competitive about it yeah. i mean we did it with my curveball a ton yeah and we would track weekly or or by pen how many curveballs i could throw in the zone for yeah. strike and we would compare it over time and it's like okay well if this doesn't change for five or six bullpens in a row we need to adjust something yeah. because something isn't working so you can still push yourself and, and try and maintain that competitive edge a little bit in the off season, just redirect it a little bit. Yep. And now you're not trying to go compete on the field. You're competing more against yourself, sure. which is a whole nother dynamic. I think it's, I don't know, it's pretty, it's pretty fun. It's awesome. Love yeah. it. So wrap it up tonight. Um, give me, if you could give advice, right? Player, parent, you've seen a ton, you've been through a ton. We kind of covered from your young age to where you are now. And, and the game is obviously my, my point to obviously the conversation, the, the close here has been a lot about the analytics and a lot about yeah. kind of how you're perceiving your career in this new world, this new front of baseball. Uh, it, you know, I, it's baseball like you and I have yeah. played it. We love it. We've grown in it. Um, if you could give parent and player kind of any advice, um, you know, kind of your main takeaway, your main take home uh, on your career, where you're at, something you'd pass along to the next generation, kind of give me your, your, uh, your biggest takeaway? God, I got to narrow it down to one. Just one. Or can I hit a couple? You can hit points? a couple. You can go a couple. I'll give you a couple. I was expecting um, one, man. Come on. <laughs> I'd say early on, remember it's a game. Love it. I, I think that's something that's really important is you can get caught up in. And I, I even saw it when I was coming up. I had friends that kind of got a little burnt out and they kind of fell out of love with the game because they just kind of lost the joy in it as they were as they were playing. Maybe it was overplaying, whatever it is. But remember it's a game, and remember that you started playing it because you love it. I think that's huge. And then uh, secondly, I, I don't know, just work hard. And if it's something that you're really passionate about, just don't leave anything on the table. Love it. Um, in today's world, you, you have all the access to the resources you need. It's kind of in your court, you know. It's it's up. It's your career. It's something that is said a ton in pro ball. It's you hear it early on, but they always say it's your career. You right. know, so it's it's your control. And you talk about it in pitching, and they say control what you can control, and it goes to your career as well in your life. It's handle your stuff. Love it, man. That's awesome. No, that's uh, again appreciate you jumping on tonight Absolutely. and, and joining time. us. I know. Uh, all the guys at the facility appreciate you being around and, and taking care of some of the younger guys, especially. They always look up to you and enjoy your wisdom. So uh, I've always enjoyed watching uh, you and Nate kind of compete. We talked about kind of that curveball, yeah. that that period. I know Nate was in there, you know, duking it out with you over curveballs. That was fun. Um, but uh, no, man, appreciate you jumping on tonight. And uh, definitely will 
be watching this year. We're pulling for you as always. KP Appreciate fam is it. behind you. So real quick to wrap it up tonight, we're going to jump over to a quick sponsor where I go out. We call it the wrap, which will be our finalizing uh, tab tonight. Talk a little bit about KP and go out. But uh, again, Jake, just want to say thanks, man, for for uh, coming out tonight and and you know hopefully. Uh, some guys out there paying attention, taking some notes. Uh, I know our guys watch it pretty close. So let's close it out with a little sponsorship. So have you ever wanted to deeper your understanding of mechanics, Jake? Oh, okay, great. Excellent. Uh, for years to get fully objective information on biomechanics, you had to visit a lab. The process was clunky. Markers, a cold lab, expensive lab equipment. It was a process that many either couldn't experience or didn't enjoy. Good news, though. Today, you can get objective data on your mechanics right in the palm of your hand. No more awkward or expensive lab, just you and your phone. ProPlay AI presents Pitch AI. Pitch AI is a groundbreaking technology, lab accurate data to you right in your palm daily. Never has been understanding how to improve your mechanics been so easy. Just capture, review, and repeat. Perfect your training anytime, anywhere. Pitch AI. Check it out today. ProPlayAI.com. Jake, you've You've had some uh, pitch AI reports, yeah. just a Very few. I cool. <laughs> love it. Excellent. Uh, we're moving on tonight to the wrap. So we'll wrap it up, guys. Uh, first and foremost, uh, if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to our channel uh, right here on YouTube. I uh, appreciate you guys uh, you know, continuously week over week showing us support and, and being a part of the community. Uh, we are going to continue to blast these out. We're on week 14, dude. 14 crazy. straight weeks. Crazy. Turn it can we keep moving up and uh it's been fun to bring on some guests uh jake mike Sone, steve merriman jumped on a couple weeks ago uh been really cool to bring everybody on so we'll be bringing on some new guests uh turn on new year Got any new year's resolutions i know uh, i gotta work on those Put, honestly. putting you on the spot i know <laughs> um so we'll be uh pushing the new year with some new stuff coming live from abca we'll be at abca with our booth come visit us uh, middle of the floor, I think 1141 is a booth number, coaches, if you're coming up. Um, that's up in Chicago. Uh, we'll also be releasing the Connect app. First time I've said it live, the Connect app. So, hey. hey. All right. Uh, we'll also be releasing a new product. Won't mention that one just yet. Uh, actually, two new products. One, KP Bands will be coming out. I know you've had some experiences. Yes. Uh, and then we've got another product that I won't mention, even though I really want to at the moment. Yeah, that's uh, cool. We'll be pushing that out maybe the next year. So, uh, or next week, sorry. So, uh, you guys stay tuned for that. Uh, come check us out in Chicago if you're going to be there. Uh, lastly, guys, if you're looking at training, as always, uh, kineticprobaseball.com. If you guys have questions on anything, you got questions for myself, you guys want to follow up and ask Woody questions, throw them to you. Yeah. We got support at kineticprobaseball.com. You guys are welcome to fire out some questions to support. Uh, and get some responses. If you guys want to come down to Tampa to train, winter's almost over. We're pushing into the spring here, uh, but let's say summer's coming back, or maybe you want to take that gap year and you want to hit full spring at KP. Uh, give us a shout. Support at connectprobaseball.com. We can help you out, get you set up, get you assessed, uh, or you can go online to connectprobaseball.com. Like I said, uh, visit the schedule or baseball tabs, and you guys will find links to the scheduler there. Uh, Woody, man, appreciate it. Want to grab some dinner? Yeah. All right. We'll catch you guys later. Uh, appreciate you guys hopping out tonight. Until next time. Later. See you.